Hello everyone and welcome to week 27 of human circulation and gas exchange. Today we are going to be looking at haematology, uh, the study of blood and blood disorders. Um, but specifically this, um, for this YouTube video we're going to be looking at the composition of blood and the structure and function of a red blood cell. So the order of events for today is that we are looking at describing the components of blood and the structure and function of a red blood cell. So we're going to explore uh, what actually makes up blood, uh, namely blood plasma and formed elements. And we're also going to look at the anatomy and physiology of a red blood cell. After we've done this, uh, you are then going to apply what you've learned via describing the components of blood and the structure and function of a red blood cell. Uh, ultimately, there's a formative assessment on Google Classroom for you to complete. And essentially, once you've completed that, that will inform, then inform you in completing uh, pages 9 and 10 of your e-workbooks. We are currently on week 27. Um, so after this week, essentially speaking, we are going on vacation for two weeks. So essentially, this is a time for you to both uh, rest and recover, uh, but also catch up on any work that you might have outstanding. Um, after the, the two weeks vacation, uh, we'll then return on the Friday 24th of April and then we're going to start looking at the two final elements. Um, in terms of last week, last week we looked at the structure and function of blood vessels. If you do want to take a look at that, um, then what I'd advise you to do is go onto my YouTube channel or go onto Google Classroom uh, and you'll be able to see the YouTube session that I created uh, last week. So the first part of today's uh, YouTube video, essentially speaking, and e-lecture, is to explore actually what you already know about the components of blood. So for those that are wanting to actually think of this, very similar to a test that we'd do, just pause it here and start to think of all the things that you already know about blood. So what actually is blood? So blood is a liquid connective tissue um, that, con that is consistent and consists of uh, formed elements surrounded by a extracellular matrix. That extracellular matrix is called blood plasma. And then for what is called formed elements, and these are essentially the cells and, and cell fragments that are uh, suspended within blood plasma. And these are red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, hormones, and proteins, amongst other things. So how does blood contribute to homeostasis? Uh, so homeostasis is defined as the condition in which the body's internal environment retains um, and remains constant and in balance. So blood contributes to keeping your body constant and in balance by transporting oxygen, removing carbon dioxide, sending nutrients to where they need to be sent in the body, um, likewise with hormones and also um, helps form our body's cells. It also helps regulate acid balance within his body. It also regulates temperature and also provides protection against disease. What are the functions of blood? So blood has three general functions. That is transportation, regulation and protection. Blood transports oxygen, carbon dioxide, nutrients, hormones and heat. Uh, in terms of heat specifically, um, blood can help regulate body temperature through the heating and cooling properties of water, which is one of the main components of blood plasma. And also it's got a protective mechanism in terms of blood can clot, which protects the body's cells um, and the body in general against excess blood loss and hemorrhaging, um, as well as white blood cells um, and antibodies um, that help protect against disease. So blood has two key components. We've got that watery uh, liquid as extracellular matrix uh, called plasma and that contains the dissolved substances which is generally um, proteins um, and then we've got what's called formed elements which are the cells and cell fragments. So to the right of this screen is an appearance of what blood would look if passed through a centrifuge and you can see ultimately the separation of the components of blood. Um, 
ultimately red blood cells are dense and they are ultimately um, cells so they've got a heavier uh, density so they sink to the bottom uh, then what you've got is a buffer coat ultimately that's your white blood cells and platelets and the rest is plasma so this ultimately is a diagram to show um, the body itself and ultimately shows you what blood is composed of and ultimately um, other fluids and tissues which ultimately give us our body weight and mass. So out of our total body weight, 8% is blood. Now if we look at what is blood made of, we can see that blood is made of 55% plasma and 45% formed elements. So as we've looked at, plasma is made up of proteins, water and other solutes and formed elements are composed of red blood cells, white blood cells and platelets. So looking specifically at plasma, plasma looks very much like a straw coloured substance. Um, as we mentioned before, it's generally composed of water but is also composed of proteins and other solutes. Um, those other solutes are things like electrolytes, nutrients, hormones, enzymes and waste products. The formed elements are red blood cells, white blood cells and platelets generally speaking. So red blood cells are the cells that transport oxygen and carbon dioxide or at least some carbon dioxide. White blood cells protect the body from invading pathogens and other foreign substances and then platelets ultimately help uh, promote blood clotting and aim to prevent hemorrhaging. So that ultimately is a um, overview of the components of blood. The next aspect is looking at what do you already know about red blood cells. So the same again, if you want to replicate this as a task similar to what we do in class, um, a couple of minutes in your own um, rooms that you're in, what do you already know about red blood cells? Just take a pause uh, when you're ready, continue. So red blood cells. So red blood cells are ultimately eight micrometers in size and this is a representation of what a red blood cell looks like. Eight micrometers is very small. One micrometer is one one thousandth of a millimeter in size. Roughly uh, your hair or one hair follicle is approximately 20 to around 100, I think 40 or 60 micrometers in size. So ultimately, if you're wanting to compare it to that, it is very small. Red blood cells are otherwise known as erythrocytes. Um, so to break down that term, erythro means red, site means cell. Um, they contain an oxygen carrying protein called um, haemoglobin, which is a key part of its physiology, which we want to look at shortly. Um, and there is a pigment within haemoglobin that gives whole blood its red colour. So essentially, um, a lot of the, the blood's or whole blood's mass is red blood cells. So given the fact that the majority is red, uh, that's what gives it its red appearance. And a healthy adult has between 4.8 to 5.4 million red blood cells per microliter. So per 0 0.001 milliliters of blood, you have got between 4.8 to 5.4 million. So if you wanted to figure out what's in a million, times that 5.8 or 5.4 uh, by 1,000, and that's what is in a millimeter of blood. It's a lot of cells. So looking at the anatomy or structure of a red blood cell, um, structurally red blood cells have a very small diameter and very small in comparison to a capillary, 7 to 8 micrometres. They have a simple cell structure, so the plasma membrane has to be both strong and flexible which helps them deform without rupturing, especially if they are passing through a capillary. They have um, no nuclei or other organelles. These are typically um, lost during the creation of a red blood cell, which essentially speaking maximizes its surface area and space. Um, generally when the nucleus is lost during the creation of a red blood cell, um, that's what generally gives it its indentation and its biconcave uh, shape. 
and essentially speaking, it maximises then its contents um, for its main role of transportation. Um, so haemoglobin is the big um, player in this and it forms around 33% uh, of its total mass. So the highly specialised for transporting oxygen and all of the space is dedicated for oxygen transport. They lack mitochondria and have to generate um, energy by other means. Mitochondria generates energy through what's called aerobic respiration, creating energy with the support of oxygen. This doesn't, it does it anaerobically without oxygen in a process called anaerobic respiration. This ultimately maximises its function of not utilising any oxygen that it's carrying. Um, they are shaped as a biconcave disc as well, so by losing its nucleus and it's essentially collapsing into a biconcave shape, it also links to its function of maximising its surface area, which means it can take up more oxygen as well. Um, and they account for approximately, when removing carbon dioxide, 25% of the total removal of CO2, and the rest is dissolved in plasma, um, which is it's called carbonic acid or created as a bicarbonate um, ion or ions. So it's very similar to bicarbonate, what you may know as bicarbonate of soda. So I'm looking at the function of the red blood cell. This diagram here is a haemoglobin molecule and these are the key uh, structures within a red blood cell that give the red blood cell its specialised function of transporting oxygen. So within one blood, red blood cell, um, it has within it 280 million haemoglobin molecules. And each of these molecules consists of a protein called glob, uh, globins. So these are these structures here. And then within them, I've got ring-like pigments. And these are called, if I can find my cursor, um, hemes, which are combined with a iron molecule. So each of these haemoglobin and heme rings can transport four oxygen molecules. So essentially speaking, one red blood cell can transport over one billion um, red blood cells, which is very, very effective in its role. Um, some um, service users that you may work with or will work with once you progress from this course uh, may develop conditions such as uh, anemia, and this is due to the lack of iron in red blood cells. So ultimately, they will lack less of these substances, which ultimately mean um, it cannot pick up as much oxygen as what it needs to. So if we are lacking in oxygen, um, when we look at ultimately modifiers of heart rate, in order to supply more oxygen to the body's cells to maintain homeostasis, the heart rate may need to increase to meet that supply and demand of oxygen. Ultimately, with medicine, we can provide um, iron tablets or um, in terms of supplementation or consume products that are high in iron with the overall intention and aim of um, increasing the iron levels, which supports um, erythropoiesis, the creation of more red blood cells, which can contain more iron, which is very important. So what are the different blood types? So we've got four main blood types, A, B, AB and O. And within these blood types, you can also be rhesus positive or rhesus negative. Um, and this is determined as to whether you've also got the presence of a um, rhesus antigen. I'll discuss um, rhesus blood types a little bit later, um, but ultimately around 85% of its population are rhesus positive. These, this is the um, population uh, based on um, UK data of the country and ultimately shows you what are the most um, highest types and also what are the most um, less common types. So for example, if you are AB positive, uh, B negative or EB negative, so AB rhesus negative, um, you would form one one hundred percent, oh sorry, one one hundredth of the, the population. So you've got a very rare blood type. If you know which category you are, 
then obviously take a look at what percentage you form of the population. I am A resource positive or A plus, so I form 30% of the population. How can you distinguish these blood types then? So the surface of blood cells contain a genetically predetermined assortment of antigens. <laughs> And based on the presence or absence of these uh, antigens determines your blood group. So these antigens are referred to as A. So A antigens, that only has A antigens present. B antigens, which only means it has B antigens present. AB has both A and B antigens. And O has neither A or B antigens. Generally speaking, within our body, you do not have antibodies that will react with your own antigens. Um, but you do have antibodies that will react with foreign antigens. It may be that, if we look at the clinical aspect of this, if someone has got an autoimmune disorder um, that attacks its own cells, um, so in this case, if you have got A antigens and you also contain anti-A antibodies, you may have what's called an autoimmune disorder called acquired autoimmune hemolytic anemia, um, which ultimately needs to be treated. Otherwise, ultimately this would cause uh, your blood cells ultimately to be attacked and destroyed, um, which is something that we'll also explore a little bit later on. So to understand antibodies and antigens, and this is very important in this current climate when we're also looking at COVID-19, but ultimately to set the scene behind what these terms mean, it's quite important to understand the actual definitions. So antigens are substances that have the ability to trigger immune response. These are found naturally in our body, but are also found within pathogens such as COVID-19 or other foreign substances. And these have the ability to react with our antibodies. Our antibodies are plasma proteins, so produced by cells within plasma, and they respond to a specific antigen. An attempt to combine to the antigen and neutralise it or destroy it. Um, if it is a new or foreign pathogen, our immune system will attempt to create new antibodies in a process called adaptive immunity. Um, you'll be looking at that quite closely in infection immunity in the other unit that you're studying with Jackie. Um, so I'm not going to dwell too much on that, but ultimately that's the process of how it works. So this is an overview of all the different blood types. So as you can see, the red blood cells, the types of antigens that they have or don't have, and also within the type A or blood type, sorry, um, what type of antibodies are contained within your plasma or not contained in your plasma. So when we look at interactions between the blood groups, so people with AB blood do not have the presence of anti-A or anti-B antibodies in the blood plasma and these are sometimes called universal recipients of blood because theoretically speaking, they can receive blood from donors of all four types. However, people with O blood have neither A nor B antigens, and these are sometimes called universal donors, and they contain uh, and, don and can donate blood to all four blood types. But the tricky thing is, is when you call someone a universal donor, ultimately this pertains to two blood groups. So these terms can be often be misleading and confusing. And if somebody does receive a different type of blood, um, that ultimately can have a transfusion reaction, which can be quite severe and potentially life-threatening in some situations. So for those that have um, resource-positive um, blood, you will form into a resource blood group. Uh, I've put at the top the definitions of antibodies and antigens just so that when I talk you through this, you can relate to the terminology a little bit more easily. So the resource blood group was first named because the resource antigen was first found in the blood of what's called a resource monkey, and the resource monkey is to the right um, of this slide. 
Um, it's very similar to the type of monkeys that are present within Gibraltar. They are just a slightly different species. Um, people whose red blood cells have the resus antigens are called resus positive. So like if you are A uh, positive, B positive, so on and so forth, you would contain and have this type of protein in your blood. And people that don't have them are called resus negative. Um, ultimately, if you have resus positive blood, you can get resus positive or resus negative uh, red blood cell transfusions. Um, but ultimately, people with resus negative blood should only get resus negative blood cells except in extreme emergencies. Uh, this ultimately is because. Um, it can cause a person to make antibodies against the resus protein and it can cause, as we've discussed before, a transfusion reaction which can be quite uh, detrimental. Um, in addition, if you are pregnant um, and you are resus negative, um, your body will make antibodies and it can seriously harm your baby if your baby becomes resus positive. Um, and ultimately this can attack against the red blood cells in the fetus. It's a very critical point during um, the development of um, a baby and a, and a fetus ultimately. So if this is compromised, it can have very serious consequences if it's not controlled and monitored. If you can hear a crashing noise, it's my tortoise that has suddenly started to move. Just trying to get under the light to warm up. Um, so in terms of today's tasks, um, there is two key tasks for you to complete. Ultimate learning out out outcome one is a formative uh, assessment that you need to complete. And learning outcome two is ultimately applying what you've learned in terms of completing your e-workbooks. So the first task ultimately is in Google Classroom there is a formative assessment titled the components of blood and red blood cells uh, and using the Google Docs worksheet I want you to complete and describe the components of blood and the structure and function of a red blood cell. Once you have done that I want you to submit and hand it in for feedback so I can give you formative feedback and once you've completed that you then can apply what you've learned by completing pages 9 and 10 of your e-workbook and ultimately that is to for 3.1 describe the components of blood and supplementary to 3.1 is relate the structure of red blood cell to its role in transportation. And that ultimately is everything for today. As this is going on YouTube, these are the references that I have used for um, this YouTube video. And next week, you know, to bridge the gap um, and resources are already on Google Classroom, if you want to take a look at this, uh, we are looking at blood plasma and tissue fluid. So the big topic areas ultimately are um, haematology and histology. So that is everything um, for this week. Thank you very much for listening. If you've got any questions, um, please do let me know. Happy to answer them.